Bay Area. We're also available on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, Roku, and Xbox One. Join us. Hello, everyone. I'm Tanya Rivero. Thank you for joining us. Coronavirus deaths are spiking at an alarming rate. For the first time since mid-May, the virus killed more than 1,500 Americans in a single day. That tally makes yesterday the deadliest day of the summer for the pandemic. So far, the U.S. has recorded more than 5.2 million cases. The death toll is above 166,000 and counting. Danya Backus reports. The coronavirus pandemic is consistently taking more lives per day than any time since May. In Texas, the positivity rate has jumped to around 24 percent, and the state reported more than 300 COVID deaths Wednesday, the most in the nation. At this college in Houston. We create um, uh, almost a bubble, if you will, for our residential students. Students are getting tested for the virus when they move on to campus. This could be the worst fall from a public health perspective we've ever had. CDC Director Robert Redfield says the upcoming flu season could compound the crisis, but Americans can't avoid the worst of it if they wear masks. We all got to do it. This is one of those interventions that got to be 95, 96, 97, 98, 99 percent if it's going to work. President Trump says the government will send up to 125 million reusable face masks to schools to help them reopen. All schools should be making plans to resume in-person classes as soon as possible. With more than a thousand Americans dying a day and coronavirus cases increasing in some areas, a new poll shows a majority of voters, 59 percent, oppose schools fully reopening. While some schools remain closed, AMC movie theaters announced it will reopen two-thirds of its U.S. locations next month. And the actors at Disney World will return to work after the theme park agreed to have a testing site on premises. Donya Backus, CBS News, Los Angeles. For more, Dr. Angela Rasmussen joins me. She is a virologist at Columbia University. Dr. Rasmussen, welcome. Great to have you with us. So, you know, as we mentioned earlier yesterday, the U.S. reported its largest single-day death toll from the virus since mid-May. However, the number of new cases does appear to be on the decline. To what can we attribute that drop? Does it have anything to do with the amount of nationwide testing? It does have something to do with the amount of nationwide testing. So while cases have decreased, there have been a number of problems with reporting data, including both testing and hospitalization data. It also appears um, from data that has been compiled at the COVID-19 tracking project that testing is uh, overall on the decline. So the fact that we're starting to see fewer cases might actually be the fact that we're doing fewer tests. That is discouraging. Now, Dr. Public Health experts say the flu season during the fall and winter will only make the outbreak worse. And on top of that, we have a lot of schools and colleges opening up for in-person learning. Do you expect a spike in coronavirus deaths later this year? And my second part of that question is, do you have any insight into how the flu season is shaping up separately this, this season? So that's a really important question about the flu season. Um, and that's why it's really important for everybody to get a flu shot if you're able to do so. Because the, the thing is, when flu season comes around, we already know that people can be co-infected with both the coronavirus and influenza virus. But flu on its own um, normally causes a number of hospitalizations and deaths during the fall. If we have that on top of the cases that we already have of COVID-19, that's going to create a tremendous burden on the healthcare system. And for that reason, uh, both the flu season, as well as the constantly high rate of, com of community transmission of coronavirus, um, I think it's very, very unsafe to have in-person schools in the fall. Wow, that's a big statement. So is it a little too early to get a read on the flu um, this year? Does that come a little bit later? That will come a little bit later because we're going to have to see which mm -hmm. strains uh, are predominantly circulating in our communities. We have to see how well the flu shot works against them and provides protection against those strains. We also have to see how many people will actually get a flu shot. 
we normally have uh, some trouble every year trying to get everyone to actually get a flu shot. So that's why I'm starting to encourage people now to actually get their flu shots once they're available, because we're going to need all the help that we can get. But aren't the flu shots that are available now, aren't they a little bit of a shot in the dark, no pun intended, since, like you said, the strain is not fully identified yet? That's correct. And every year that's the case. So we try to guess which strains will be predominantly circulating in the United States based on surveillance data, as well as data from the Southern Hemisphere, which has their flu season before ours. So it's always a little bit of guesswork. And some years we get it better than others. Um, time will tell how well we do at predicting which strains are going to be prevalent uh, once flu season actually starts um, for real. Boy, I really don't know if we are prepared for a double whammy of coronavirus and flu coming up. So when we do finally get a coronavirus vaccine, doctor, will we still see a large number of Americans dying from the coronavirus? How long will it take to catch up, if you will? It will probably take several months at minimum to catch up. Um, because once we have a vaccine, so that, that should reduce deaths, because all the vaccine candidates that we have now in phase three trials, at least in animals, they appear to reduce the severity of disease. Um, so that will be a major public health benefit. The challenge is really going to be getting as many people vaccinated as possible as quickly as possible. And it's going to take some time to make sure that everybody gets access to these vaccine candidates. And that probably will take months just because it's going to take time to actually manufacture and then distribute those vaccines. And doctor, the World Health Organization warned at the beginning of the pandemic about false information circulating online. Have you seen that factor into our country's death toll? Absolutely. Um, many of the, the people who are not taking the precautions that need to be taken to minimize community transmission are doing so because of information that is just plain incorrect. Uh, that, for example, the coronavirus is not very serious or that the death rate is much lower than we know it to be. Um, when people don't take precautions based on a, a false sense of security, um, not believing that the pandemic is as serious as it is, they will put themselves at, at risk of becoming infected or they are more likely to put themselves at risk of becoming infected. We've also seen people rely on treatments that have either been unproven or are actually shown not to work, such as hydroxychloroquine. Um, many people still continue to advocate for the use of that drug, even though we have no evidence that it's effective at treating coronavirus infection. So misinformation has been right. a huge problem during this pandemic. And, and Doctor, quickly, before we have to let you go, you know, you said earlier that you didn't think opening schools in the fall was safe at this point because of the double whammy threat of continued coronavirus spread and the flu season. What would you tell parents who are weighing this question right now? They're trying to decide, should I send my child back to school? Should I take the online option? Because most schools are offering some version of an online option. What factors would you tell them to weigh in making that decision? I understand that it is really challenging to educate kids from home remotely, especially younger kids, and it's really hard on the parents too. But I would say to parents, um, consider whether you value your child's educational life or their actual life um, or your family's life, because that is what is at stake in sending children back to school in person. Children can become infected with the virus. They can become very sick and even die from the virus, and they can transmit it to other people in their households. So if it's a question between education and your actual life, like that is the decision you need to weigh. Wow. All right. Well, Dr. Angela Rasmussen, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise with us. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks, Tanya. Meanwhile, many state and local officials will not rule out having fully remote instruction in the new school year. Nearly 600 school districts in New Jersey have just been given the option to go completely online this fall. It is a dramatic shift for the governor. He tells Meg Oliver why he changed his mind. And the last thing we want to do is open a school or a district irresponsibly. After months of insisting all schools return to some form of in-person learning, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy is now changing course. Looking ahead to the fall, what is your main goal? Our main goal is to get to in-person instruction, but to do it safely. We're now saying to school districts that don't feel that they can get there on day one safely, 
with all the health protocols. Uh, we're going to work with them to get them there. And yet he's not ruling out ordering a statewide all remote learning mandate even at the 11th hour. I think superintendents are extremely concerned they're wasting their time developing these hybrid no, models. Yeah, no, they're not wasting their time. Even if at the last minute you have to say, hey, we have to go all remote. You just can't take off the table that this thing is going to rear its head and we have to be prepared for that. English teacher Tom Keita says he's frustrated by the